Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today, and welcome back to tonight's second half. Before we get into tonight's second half, a couple links I'd like to share. As you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, and my merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. The links to Patreon and PayPal are in the description below, my merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, the links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support this channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe, click the like button, and please leave a comment. It really does help, and guys, it definitely matters. And now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's get on with tonight's second half, shall we? So for the four and a half, almost five years of me doing this channel and interviewing different people, narrating encounters that are sent to me, there are a few that really weigh on me for some reason. And I don't know why. It's not that I like them any better. It's not that they're scarier than any more. It's something about them. And tonight is one of those that really just took its effect on me, to be honest with you. I, I worried about this person and reached out to him a couple different times. Uh, well, yeah, let's get into it so you guys can see. In the first week of May 2020, I had an encounter that I'm still having problems coming to terms with. Due to reasons I will explain in my experience, I am not comfortable giving my name or the details of exactly where this happened. I'm a pretty normal guy living in Delaware on the border of southeastern Pennsylvania. I'm a lover of the outdoors, and in the past few years, I have not had any time to really get out into nature and get my much-needed dose of the natural world. In 2019, I opened my own online business, and due to the recent COVID-19 pandemic, and the whole world being stuck at home on their computers, my sales tripled the first half of this year. I have two children, who are now very responsible and trustworthy teenagers. My girlfriend works at a local hospital and is considered an essential worker, so the pandemic has kept her very busy this year. I turned 40 this year, and for the first time in my adult life, I had some time on my hands and was itching to get away from civilization. I had an internet hotspot router built into my SUV that works almost anywhere, no matter how remote. So with a laptop, I figured I could work from the road and take a few days to go fishing and breathe some much-needed fresh air. Neither of my teenagers were interested in joining me, and like I said, my girlfriend was far too busy with work, so I took my best friend with me, a 120-pound pit lab mix named Pete. He makes a great camping dog because he's incredibly lazy, and I've never had to worry about him running off and chasing deer or anything like that. He will lie on his blanket next to a fire all day and night, unless I make him head out with me. But, as I've learned while camping with Pete, if coyotes, bears, or any other predator comes around, he snaps out of his laziness and protects the camp. Despite his easygoing demeanor, Pete is pretty intimidating, as he is 120 pounds of muscle with no fat, which always blows my mind because of how lazy and inactive he is. I try to go camping at least once a year, and when I do, I usually rough it with a small tent and whatever I can carry on my back. But this time, I decided that I wanted to have as many comforts of home and really pamper myself. So I hitched my 10-foot enclosed cargo trailer to my very large SUV, filled it with all of the things that I would really want to be comfy. I brought my full-sized backyard grill, a 12 by 12 pop-up canopy, an air mattress, two large coolers full of food, and a fancy six-person tent. The campground I decided to go to is a large one that is mostly used by RV kind of crowd. 
But on the far end, right next to the best fishing area they have, a dozen or so just plain old campsites with no power or water hookups exist. My campsite was bordered by about 50 yards of thick woods that separated my camp from a very fast-moving stream that is well known to be one of the best trout fishing spots in the whole state. On the other side of that stream is a steep mountainside that is covered in rock overhangs and small caves. It's a beautiful area and I love falling asleep to the sound of water. I set up the camp so that my SUV, trailer, and pop-up canopy make a sort of U-shape and block most of the view into my area from the rest of the campers. I rented my campsite for a full week starting on Friday, May 1st which was the first day that the state opened up the state parks and campgrounds to the public since the pandemic shutdown. Back in March, I arrived at the campground at about midday on Friday and the place was packed. I spent most of the day getting my campsite set up, getting to know my temporary neighbors and cooking ribeye steaks, burgers, and vegetables on the grill. The weather in central PA in early May is pretty much perfect, so I decided to sleep in the tent each night with Pete and turned my trailer into a mobile office where I kept my computer, internet goods, mailing packages, and even a printer for printing postage. This way I could work for an hour or so each morning, get my orders packed up, and drive 20 minutes into the nearest town once every few days to get my orders shipped out. I remember thinking that I wish I could convince my girlfriend and kids to just sell everything and move into the woods and live just like this. The weekend was crazy busy at the campground and the creek was lined with fishermen as far as the eye could see. So I decided to do some hiking and exploring into the surrounding wilderness with Pete instead of fighting 10 people for the same one fish all day. It felt great to get out to where I really belonged. The woods The only negative was that it rained on and off all weekend while I was hiking. But, to be honest, when you camp in Pennsylvania, you should expect to get rained on regularly. On the afternoon of Sunday, May 3rd, the campground cleared out fast, and by sundown, there were only a few active campsites left. I had gotten to know the two guys in the campsite directly next to mine, so we hung out for a few hours a night. Well, I drank hot tea and they smoked joints like they were cigarettes. Needless to say, they were always hungry and seemed pleased to have me next door with my full-sized grill and enough food to feed a small army. For the next few days, I worked online, fished the creek, explored the mountains of the area on foot with my dog. We also liked to just hike around the campground itself and stop and talk with scattered campers who were there during the weekday. On Tuesday afternoon, a few of them told me about a black bear who had made its way into a more accessible side of the campground and raided their camps the night before. This had me a little concerned because I had a full-sized grill sitting out in the open at my camp. That had been cooking delicious food for days on end. I debated putting the grill inside of my enclosed trailer at night, but laziness got the best of me and I left it out. Central Pennsylvania has a rather large black bear population, and I was already aware of this. So, that night I slept with my Mossberg Maverick 88 12-gauge shotgun loaded with double-op buck in the tent with Pete. And, I just in case a rogue beer bear posed a danger to us, I had forgotten to pack my Ruger Redhawk 44 mag for hiking, so while out in the woods I had to rely on my S&W Shield 45 ACP that I already had on my hip when I left home. It was not ideal, but I figured it was better than nothing. On the night of Tuesday, May 5th, my new friends and I cooked up some barbecued chicken thighs, baked beans, and some baked potatoes wrapped in aluminum foil on my fire pit. They produced a small bottle of vodka as well, and we made a few orange soda spiked drinks to go with our fancy campsite dinner. All the food and drinks combined with too much fun had worn us all out a little. So we parted ways and got ourselves prepared to crash for the night. A night that would prove to be the most terrifying night of our lives. At about 10 p.m., I loaded four shells of buck into my 12-gauge. 
got my tent all squared away and lied down in the tent with my dog next to me on his bed and blanket. I put some citizens journalist news on my phone and put one headphone in my right ear and kept my left ear clear to listen to my surroundings and to enjoy the sounds of nature. My tent was pitched close to the tree line with the rear of the tent facing the woods. The noise of the frogs and insects at night was super loud and this is a kind of song that puts me to sleep better than any lullaby ever could. The next thing I remember is waking up and my eyes popping open to some kind of howl metallic noise outside of my campsite. I lied there perfectly still with my heart slamming from a quick spike of adrenaline that flooded my veins. Then bang, I heard the lid on my grill slam shut. I had stuck my fairly bright solar-powered motion light on the side of my trailer that lit up my small U-shaped courtyard area with vehicles and tents. My tent was facing the open part of the U, and I could see that my motion light was on, and someone or something was moving around my camp, casting shadows as it went. I looked at Pete to my right, and he was still lying down, but his head was up, and his eyes were as big as ping-pong balls. He was clearly hearing what I was hearing, but I found it strange that he was silent. It was then that I noticed the usual deafening noise of frogs and insects in the woods behind me was not there. Then I heard whatever it was breathing. It was a hoarse, deep breathing that was when I thought to myself, bear. I could hear it walking around, thump, thump, thump. And next, I heard it at my trailer, pulling at the side door, trying to get inside, so I sat up and grabbed my shotgun. One thing about black bears is that they are not the bravest animals, and any man-made noise will almost always make them run for their lives, so I racked the slide of my shotgun as loud as I could and chambered a shell. Instead of running off, the creature stopped moving and went silent. I could feel the fear building up inside of me as I pretty much held my breath and listened. To my horror, I started walking toward my tent. It was then that I saw its shadow take shape as it drew closer. It was on two feet and apparently huge. I sat there in terror and disbelief as it came right up to the front of my tent, breathing like a giant monster. I said out loud, whoever you are, I have a 12 gauge pointed right at you. So you had better sound off who you are. Right then it leaned forward right up to the tent and let out the most terrifying and deep growl I had ever heard in my life. At that moment, Pete whined softly and cowered his head down. It was then that the shadow of its head was clearly visible. It had a giant head of a wolf with two pointed ears. As it was growling at me, I could hear my neighbors talking to each other, and one of them shined a flashlight on the creature. When the light hit the side of the creature's face, I saw the eyes light up like a golden LED. It turned its face toward the flashlight, and I could hear the man gasp and say, What is that? Then it turned its attention back to me and growled again. I decided that if I didn't do something, this thing was going to kill us, so I lied back onto my sleeping pad, took aim at the shadow of this monster's head, and pulled the trigger. What followed was complete and total pandemonium. The monster screamed and roared at the same time. It was like the death scream of a woman mixed with the roar of a large lion. Pete finally snapped out of his fear, jumped up, and started barking ferociously. The thing ran off, and from what I could tell from the loud thump, it ran straight into my trailer. I clambered up and quickly unzipped my tent and poked my head outside to see. It got up on its feet, then ran right into the picnic table and did a flip onto the ground. It started grabbing its face and thrashing around. I could see that there was blood everywhere on the trailer. I jumped out of the tent while chambering another shell. I aimed as best as I could with my whole body shaking violently, and right as it started to get up again, I shot a second time. Now, I'm not entirely sure that I hit it the second shot. It stood straight up, I pumped the gun and shot again. The third shot dropped it again. I was so terrified and taken back at how tall it was when it stood up that I tripped over my own feet and fell backwards. 
Just then I heard more gunfire erupt behind me and turned to see my neighbor unloading a large revolver into this werewolf-looking thing at maybe 20 yards. The creature was on its side and was kind of running in circles on the ground gurgling and spraying blood from its face and neck as it gasped. As it was doing this death spiral on the ground, it was moving closer to me. So I tried to pump the gun again and was shaking so bad that it took three attempts before the last shell chambered. I just pointed and shot without aiming and could see the hump on its back of its neck rip open and spray blood and flesh all over the place. I was really close to it at this point. The monster stopped flipping out and its limbs were twitching while its head remained fully animated and flopping back and forth for at least another ten seconds. I crawled quickly backwards away from it and tried to stand up. I realized once I stood up that I'd been holding my breath the whole time and when I got to my feet my vision started to go black and I fell over again. My new friend ran up and grabbed my arms and started to pull me hard backwards away from this creature. I stood up shaking badly and looked at the guy with the revolver. His eyes were huge and full of terror. When I started looking around, there were at least another five people showing up with their same wild-eyed expression. I saw that at least three of them had come over with their guns. People were yelling and asking each other what had happened and checking to see if I was injured because I had blood on my clothes and on my face. It all happened quickly, but as is often told by people facing traumatic experiences, it seemed like it was in slow motion to me. My dog still barking and going crazy, so I did my best to calm Pete down. When I hugged him, he was shaking as much as I was. Before long, a small crowd had formed, and people were on their phones calling 911. After a minute or so, a few guys and myself approached the thing. As it lay there, still occasionally twitching, we all stood over it, saying, What the? Over and over, eventually, we all started saying it was a werewolf in disbelief. All at once, people started taking pictures with their phones, mine still in the tent. The wolf man was dead. The top half of its head was basically gone, including both of its eyes and the top of its snout. I assumed that was the first shot I had made from the tent. The front of its neck was completely shredded, and the back of its neck was missing a large chunk of meat. Other than that, it was pretty much impossible to see exactly what other injuries it had sustained, as it was completely covered from head to toe with blood. But we were all pretty sure it had taken buckshot or three fifty seven magnums to the chest as well. There was a small river of blood running through the camp and right past my tent from the puddle that surrounded this creature. It was a lot of blood. It was on its side and after a few minutes we summoned the courage to grab some big sticks and flip it onto its back. It was most definitely a male as it had a huge set of balls bigger than my fists. It was huge. We never measured it, but it was longer than any man I had ever seen before. It had dog-like legs and weird-shaped paws with a kind of small heel for feet. Looking back, I'm impressed it was able to balance such a big body on feet so small. It had really skinny lower legs and pretty thick upper legs. It had arms pretty much like a human's with long fingers that had filthy-looking claws maybe three to four inches long. I noticed it was missing the top half of a finger from the battle. Then the second wave of terror hit us all at once. The howling of multiple animals sounded off in the direction of the mountain behind the creek. We all looked at each other and I could see the same big-eyed look go every, over everyone's face. I ran to my tent and clumsily loaded my shotgun with a full five rounds this time and grabbed my forty-five as well and clipped it to the side of my inside waistband. I also grabbed my phone. All of a sudden everyone was done looking at the werewolf and was looking into the woods in the direction of the howling. It kept up for a few minutes and we could hear the howling getting further and further away. The police and game wardens, paramedics, showed up all at once. I could see from the flashing lights that they had blocked the entrance to the campground up the hill, off in the distance. The cops were just as surprised and freaked out as we were when they first saw this creature. 
Two game wardens looked worried, not surprised. They told everyone not to take any pictures and made everyone clear the general area. The wardens were both on their phones almost the whole time from then on. Paramedics cleared everyone and tried to get me to agree to go up to the hospital to get checked out, but I refused. The only injury I had was to my hearing as I was half deaf for a few days from all the gunfire and noise. The paramedics were also very silent and looked worried, much like the game wardens. The police took my shotgun and the revolver from my neighbor. They let me keep my forty-five. They made everyone else put their guns away, and anyone who was there was rounded up for questioning. Everyone was told to stay off their phones, which was not much of a problem, as only a few people's phones got signal on the campground. When I asked the game wardens just what in the hell this thing was, they told me they didn't know, but that it looks like some kind of mutant bear or large canine. A few hours later, an SUV full of guys show up. They were all carrying large glocks dressed in cargo pants and t-shirts. They immediately took me and the others who were involved aside and began questioning us. They told me that they were with Federal Fish and Game. They were very interested in the howling we had heard after the battle occurred. They must have asked me ten times about where it was, how close it was, and what it sounded like, etc. They also repeated to me a hundred times that I was not to tell anyone what happened and that they would get to the bottom of things and find out what I had encountered. They told me to tell anyone who asked about my trailer that I had to shoot an aggressive black bear. I assume they told my neighbor and anyone else who was on the scene the same thing. They made us open our phones and go through our photos and delete the pics we took all at once. They also told me that if any pictures were to come out of this creature, that it would spell trouble for anyone who had them. They threatened me with all kinds of trouble if this got out. They did not try to pretend that I was seeing things. They just point blank and politely asked me not to talk about it and to lie about trailer damage. It would seem that I was asleep for only two hours before the dog man showed up. By about four in the morning, the officials had already gotten to everyone in the campground, and I assumed the other people were told it was a bear and made to pack up and get ready to go. They said it was not safe, and they had to close the campground until they were sure it was safe. After the dog man was bag tagged, a small fire truck was brought in, and all the blood was hosed off of my trailer, vehicle, tables, everything else, and the blood on the ground was hosed into the woods behind my tent. Then a few guys wiped down my trailer and vehicle with soapy water and hosed them off again. Regular old duct tape was put over the holes in my trailer and they took my tent, bloody clothes, bloody slippers, as evidence along with my shotgun. Right before I left, they gave me it back, wiped down and unloaded. They told me to fill up my tank at the closest town and drive straight home without stopping. They repeated it three times to me. Since all this, I have learned everything I can about what I encountered. I listen to dog man and werewolf encounter stories day and night, and that is how I came across your channel. I figured I'd reach out to you. I am amazed that the authorities were able to keep, keep such a no, noisy event with so many witnesses under wraps. I've been searching for anyone who came forward or anything about campground closing in the news, and nothing I am not interested in putting myself out there any more than just this for now. I'm almost as scared of the agents as I am of the dogman. But all in all, they seem genuinely concerned for my well-being. That's how the first email ended. I reached out to him again and asked if he was okay and if he was willing to talk. I trust that you're a good person and all, but... I fear that they may be watching you due to other uploads of yours I've listened to about that guy named Victor. I find it interesting that one of the agents that really had me cornered for a while that night had a thick southern accent. I suppose he may have come from your friend's Virginia group. I will see if I can put together an online phone number and call you while on proxy server. I'm sorry for the paranormal paranoia, but 
Life has been going very well with the exception of this encounter. I am terrified of those guys, agents, messing my life up. I can't afford things to go sideways for my family. And I right now. My state of mind is pretty jumpy these days. I won't even take my trash cans out without my big revolver. If I do get set up together to call you, what time is the best time? If you have any questions in the meantime, go ahead and email me them. I will make sure to check this account for you each day. Third email. I was reading through comments on the show of my story. A few people had questions, it seems. No, none of the guys in the Denali had long guns, just Glocks. I asked the older southern guy what kind it was, and he said a Glock 20 10 millimeter. I really didn't give all that much detail on the description of the monster looking back in the email to you. The dead dog man smelled horrible, like a combination of a barnyard animal mixed with strong dog piss. Also, it did have a tail, a small tail, maybe two feet at the longest. The dog man was dark brown all over. Oddly enough, I do remember that it had some lighter brown stripes on its arm where the blood wasn't totally soaked in, in the upper arm area. It was fluffy with fur, not sparse, hairy thing I hear others talk about in their encounters. This one was fully covered in fur, like an actual dog, even its arms and legs. But when it stood up in front of me, it did seem to have some white in the middle of its chest. I could be wrong, because I only saw it that way for a second. The next time I saw its chest, it was completely covered in blood. The skin on the tip of its snout and under its bottom jaw were both sheared off from the buckshot, but its teeth were undamaged. As it lay there, it had its mouth open, and its teeth were very weird. All of them were pointed and seemed like they would fit together like a shark's teeth or an alligator. The teeth were bloody but very visible. They seemed unnatural to me. My college major involved the study of teeth and fossils, so I have a good understanding of tooth structure and which type of teeth are designed for what, and it would seem that its teeth would only be useful for biting large chunks of flesh off to be swallowed whole, like a shark or a gator. They were not reminiscent of normal canine teeth in that way. After listening to hundreds of encounters the past few months, a common theme is that they seem to like the softer inner organs of their prey, while often leaving the meat behind. I wonder if it's because they swallow their food in large chunks, and obviously softer organs would be much easier in dealing with than bone and tougher muscle. Just a thought. This is going to sound a bit silly, but I have to say this, Jeff. There was a feeling of something supernatural from the beginning. I cannot describe it, but a feeling of something supernatural was even in the air, even when I thought it was just a bear. It's like everything felt wrong and reality had ceased to exist for that minute. How would every frog and insect for hundreds of yards know to be quiet? Why would a land animal like a dog man have teeth like an alligator? How did it keep flipping out and running around with its brains falling out of the top of its head? The very air around me felt like it had a weird charge. I feel like there is something important about these creatures that we just don't quite understand. Something supernatural. Give me some time and I'll get a Skype number together this week or next week and give you a call. What's a good time and day for you? Fourth email. I've been having weird things going on. Someone has been calling my phone from different international phone numbers and hanging up on me after 10 seconds of silence. I can tell it is a landline by the noise it makes when they hang up. It also lets me know that it's an actual person and not a robocall. A black SUV with a guy who wears a headset with a mic has been outside of my home in early mornings. He leaves right before 6.30 a.m., right about the beginning when rush hour starts. Yesterday, a white Range Rover pulled into my driveway in the middle of the day. I happened to be working in my kitchen when it happened, so I was facing the window when they did. I saw the two guys in the vehicle sitting there scanning the house and talking to each other. I always carry a gun now, even when I'm home alone with the kids. So I popped the button on my holster, secure trap, strap, and went to the front door and quickly opened it. The two guys looked at me and casually pulled out of my driveway. I did notice that they had an out-of-state license plate. 
because it was just plain white. Definitely not Delaware. I'm sorry for this, Jeff, but I'm going to have to stop corresponding for a while. I can't help but notice that this stuff started happening after I contacted you. I could just be paranoid, but like I told you previously, I have a happy and almost perfect life right now. I have a lot to lose. I hope you understand. Feel free to let your listeners know. So I waited about nine months, and I contacted him again. Redacted name. Hey, it's Jeff Nadalny. How are you? I'm reaching out to make sure you're okay. I'd love to speak with you sometime, and of course, would honor the stipulations. Jeff. I'm fine. I've not been seen anything weird or had any men in black types watching me for a while now. I've made up my mind to not do any kind of interviews or talk directly with anyone for their safety as well as my own. I'm still shocked that none of the pictures taken that night slipped through the cracks and came online. I've made up my mind to just send the encounters to numerous cryptid channels and give it more exposure to your peers and their listeners. I have to think that more than one of the people that were there that night had gone online looking to see if the story had made it into the world beyond our campsite experience. If so, I'm hoping that someone with more balls than me found a way to hide a few pics or a few minutes of video from the guys in the SUV and will anonymously leak them somehow. Thanks for doing your part to spread your word of my encounter as well as many others. If I had not had my experience that I did, I certainly would have looked at these stories like those of your source, Victor, as ridiculous, but I would imagine that with real-life monsters roaming into populated campsites and neighborhoods that the government would indeed have to have some kind of task force to deal with them. Don't worry about me, I'm fine. Let's hope someone else has a few pictures that can break this thing wide open. Like I said, there are encounters that just, for some reason, take space in this little, I guess, closet in my brain where I always think about them or periodically I'll think about them and wonder if this person's okay and if they're dealing with everything okay. Um, And it doesn't mean that I like their encounters any better or I think they're scarier or anything else. Um, it just something about the encounter popped at me and it just stuck. I really think with this, it may have been that I really wanted to talk to the individual. And for some reason they were very, I guess, um, cautious and more or less, tiptoey for a lack of a better word but this is one of those encounters and uh, i hope you enjoyed it as much as i enjoyed sharing it with you please everyone stay safe uh stay equipped for this mega storm we are getting hit with from i guess it's out from michigan all the way to the east coast uh so please everyone be safe take care of yourself and uh With that, thank you for all your support. May the Great Spirit watch out for us all, and may he guide us down that path that we call life.